Don't be afraid of taking risks. This is a key message I want to convey: is do not ever worry about risks to the point that you don't take actions, because the best growth usually comes from the worst failures. There are secrets out there, guys. Performance marketing secrets, and knowing just one or two of them can absolutely light up your funnels. Let's go. This is the Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your host, Chris Mechanic. Join me as I uncover the secrets of the world's most elite CMOs and marketing leaders. The Revenue Driven CMO is sponsored by Web Mechanics, the AI-driven performance agency that makes you smarter. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO. I'm your main man, Chris Mechanic, here with a really, really exciting guest for you today. She's a business executive specialized in revenue driving go-to-market strategy. Uh, She's all about innovation, building high-performing marketing teams with 10x measurable business impact. Uh, She's a featured speaker. She's an advisor. She has a resume like you wouldn't believe. Uh, She got her start originally at Yahoo, followed by Visa. Uh, She is currently vice president of marketing at apps flyer which is a really innovative high growth uh, mobile measurement platform and she's also an advisor at flow gpt uh, but ladies and gentlemen really excited to introduce and please give a warm welcome to miss carolyn bow how are you carolyn i'm doing well thank you chris uh, i really love the show so i'm really glad to be invited to join you and your audience uh, and share some of my own learnings and insights uh, hopefully it'll help uh, your listeners as well as they navigate their own career perfect yeah i'm looking forward to it and i know that you are uh, revenue driven at the core uh, which i which i really like and appreciate and i like that um in your bio it doesn't really say marketing executive it says business executive which is i think you know a nod to that revenue uh to that revenue driven mentality but why don't you go ahead here- Go ahead and share with folks, like, what is one of the big secrets to your success in marketing? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I think um, I look back in my own career. Thank you for the introduction. I will probably splurge a little bit just to kind of show um, and explain who I am a tiny bit more. Please. Um, I have not only been a marketing executive, but I also had a short but very meaningful two years of a startup founder experience. Oh, wow. uh, Where in those two years, I've learned a ton. Um, You know, the usual you have heard cleaning the toilet as such. But more importantly, uh, we built a team. We had uh, hired about a dozen full-time employees. And two years later, I decided to uh, part ways with it, but learned a ton uh, through really, truly not only wearing the marketing hat, but wearing the revenue driving business executive hat. And that carried on and and really helped me to become a different marketer. But why did I do what this, uh, all this, you know, I've, I've mentioned to you and it might might be useful for the audience to hear. I have been on the front line working as a social media center of excellence uh, marketer. I have, uh, this was actually with Visa USA under Antonio Lucio. Um, I also had um, led and managed several marketing websites, including Visa and Box. Then I switched over and sold SEO software for a few years. Then I came back to my roots, which is advertising solutions, and led uh, product marketing globally for Meta uh, and launched uh, its very first Facebook attribution product. Now, coming back to AppsFire is where I really found my sort of native habitat uh, to do what I love doing, which is intellectual products that helps more marketers to succeed. Yeah. But why did I do all these? This is sort of a jungle gym that not, it's not common. A lot of uh, uh, marketing executives would have been a you know, brand marketer, senior director, VP of branding, marketing, you know, and then becomes a C- CMO. I did everything um, in that kind of a winded road because at my core, I'm a super curious person. Mm-hmm. Um, if Curious George would have a face, I guess it would be me. I'm <laughs> always <laughs> super curious. So that led me to choose some of the things when at the time they were risky 
And oftentimes I found myself taking on jobs that by traditional wisdom would be, are you serious? Are you ready? But I am curious and I believe I can learn. So that curiosity drove me to take new opportunities, learn new things much faster and apply them in a sensible approach now that I have really perfected and I'm happy to share, uh, which is what I believe is a data-driven risk versus reward analysis. Okay, got it. So I want to hear about the data-driven uh, risk-reward analysis, but I'm also curious, uh, well, look, I'm curious, were you just born curious or did you develop that curiosity? Like, how did you become so curious? Yeah, that's a really good question. In fact, um, it might be really interesting to kind of go back the memory lane a little bit. I was not taught to challenge the status quo. I was actually born and raised uh, in the capital city of COVID, pop quiz. It's the city of Wuhan in China. So my K-12 education was very much do not challenge your authority, take the test, score well, you get rewarded. So coming to U.S. and learning my master's uh, with Emory, thank you, Emory, I was deeply shocked at first, but I was really gradually embracing this true color of me, which is if I'm told of a principle, a formula, did it really work? And also be very okay, like give yourself the license to say, I'm told that things work this way in this org. I'm told that you're supposed to do things uh, by following these steps. Increasingly, as I, as I found that I am entrusted to do something, I am extremely curious and I want to think through all the possible solutions. By doing so, what I have found is that actually is deeply important for companies that are not optimized for operational excellence, but really optimizing for innovation-driven technology, innovation-driven breakthroughs. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm who I am not because how I was originally built, to answer your question. I am who I am because I was both given the training from my business school and given the opportunity, which something also useful to mention, my very first job out of uh, MBA was a operational driven company. Yeah. That our core business competence was to optimize every single transaction where we hired Six Sigma black belts yeah. to come and make sure we understand the operational steps. And we have playbooks, mm -hmm. very well documented. This is a company based in Florida. We had a billion dollar business back in 2000. Wow. 2003, to be, to be exact. But when I moved to the West Coast, um, my first job was with Yahoo, mm -hmm. and we had very little playbook. So that was a cultural shock, number one. Yeah. How can you guys do this? You are so big. Yeah. And, and, and a few, few more years later, I just rolled with the punches, and a few years later, um, I was very, as always, very curious and thought, I learned to become a product marketer through all these painful lessons. Why don't I create a class? So I created a course. Mm -hmm. As I was reflecting on that, it dawned on me, the marketers needed in an operational driven company need to play different roles versus the marketers who are in innovation driven companies such as Visa, such as Facebook, Yahoo. We really needed people to challenge the status quo yeah. Be okay. Be very comfortable to say, I'm doing something nobody has done ever before. Mm -hmm. That is the fun. That is the sport we're playing. So why don't we learn fast, try things, make mistakes fast, and then beautiful things will come out of this try. Yeah. Uh, I'll pause. I, I, can, I can talk a lot, but uh, I hope this was a useful insight. 
It was. It was. Hey, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, Web Mechanics will do 10 to 20 hours of work for you for free. Literally no sales calls, no BS. Just give them a problem and they will put a team to work for you for free for 10 to 20 hours. Even if you're already a client, if you're struggling with demand gen, lead gen, SEO, SEM, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, conversion optimization. If you can't get Facebook or meta ads to work for the life of you, or you can't figure out attribution, web mechanics will take a good hard look at whatever problem you give them, whatever programs you put in front of them, and they will give you an objective informed opinion, plus some advice from 10 to 20 hours of senior level attention. So I would suggest take them up on this offer. It's ridiculous. Go to revenue driven CMO com slash free fill out the two minute form and you will not regret it literally zero downside unlimited potential for growth so do yourself a favor revenue driven cmo.com slash free no hyphens no punctuations you will be happy about that decision and it sounds almost like a tale of opposites it sounds like growing up in china being challenged not to, or being asked not to challenge the authority is in a way uh, being asked not to be curious. So then when you came here and you found that, hey, maybe that curiosity is an asset, then that maybe propelled you to be a little bit extra curious, like a little bit more curious than you might have been. And then you experience that same stark contrast, it sounds like, in your first two roles out of school. That's right. That's right. Um, but the good news for listeners is that it does sound like that curiosity was nurtured and and grown over time, especially when you started learning that it could be an asset. Um, I still want to get to your risk reward decision making model, but uh, for folks that may not be naturally curious, what advice would you give them to maybe to maybe uh, strengthen that curiosity muscle a little bit? Yeah, that's a really excellent question because even for me, it wasn't natural. Um, I think I realized um, as we do our work, one of the natural places to start fostering that sense of curiosity is to ask yourself why. Um, I'll give you a very specific example. I used to create a bunch of PowerPoints to teach our Yahoo advertisers how they should be creating their advertising copies. A small example is a bank. Come and get the best loan. That ad is not as convincing as come and get the best loan, interest rate as low as these days, probably 5% is, is a good uh, yeah. it's a good thing. So that data, whether or not having that data, is making a huge difference. I've, I've created enough of that content, but I was curious, this is what we say. Is this what the advertisers also believe? Really, what's working? So then I first started interviewing advertisers and that was my first baby step of taking that curiosity to practice. Mm -hmm. And increasingly I was getting some feedback from advertisers. Then it made me wonder, what do you do after you get this ad? What do you do when people click on your ad? If they did, how do you measure them? And Yahoo at the time, we never saw conversion data. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge thing in the advertising industry. Um, but so all of the insights I had at Yahoo stopped before conversion. Right. And that was when Visa, the Visa opportunity came, uh, came around. I jumped on the opportunity because I was always curious what happens with the transaction. And so my story, I want to, I hope this is helpful, is to encourage listeners out there, you can foster curiosity from your day-to-day -day work and figuring out both why, is, why are things happening the way they do? And second is, what happens beyond what your immediate span of control? That's a really good one. Yeah, and I think for a lot of marketers, I think what happens on those sales calls is an example of that, right? Very true. It's like, hey, we got 100 leads, two of them closed into deals. We have just CRM records to go off of. Like, what really happened? That's I personally right. am always dying to get my hands on call recordings or, or transcripts. I was about to say that. Um, I think one of the 
super important tips for all the marketers out there is to make sure we know our customers as well as our salespeople do. But we also have the huge advantage of knowing it more than salespeople do. So if you're not yet listening to Gong Calls, absolutely put that onto, onto the weekly to-dos. Yeah. And meanwhile, knowing that we do fly the airplane at the 30 feet height versus sales have to do these you know, hands-on battles on the ground, we see more. So one of the beauties that we really will have a deeper appreciation for the clients is to leverage the primary and secondary research. Sales doesn't have the headspace to mm-hmm. afford that time. We do, and we have the tools with ChatGPT and everything. Yeah, It is a miss if we don't do that because, and I'll expand just a tiny bit on that too, is what pains me the most is marketers who are not curious and they take sales' words for it. Mm-hmm. And they say, this is my marketing plan. This is my messaging. And you ask them why the feedback was, this is what the sales asked for. Mm-hmm. That is a red flag for me because we're then not adding value to the table. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. And that primary and secondary research, I think, is is a lost art in some regards. I'm a student of Ogilvy. I love David Ogilvy, and that's what he he chalks up his success to so just basically doing crazy amounts of research on on the customer. So true. Um, man, we could we could go like we could just keep going. I have like seven follow up questions, but I want to hear about your uh, your risk reward analysis as it comes to this. And I'm I think it ties back to the curiosity mechanism, but Very I'm interested true. to. Okay, like, so you're curious about something, then how does that risk reward uh, equation play out? Yeah, I have found that that, um, one of the things that is confusing for not only marketers, for professionals in general, is um, there are a lot of, um, there's oftentimes we're either caught in the state of anxiety because we're worried about what might happen or we're caught in the in the mode of regrets. Oh, uh, God, I wish I didn't do this. I wish so-and-so didn't do this to me. But ultimately, I have come to peace with almost any decisions I have made. And I attribute that back into risk versus reward. So I'll break this down a little bit. I have found that in almost any decision in life and work, is a risk versus reward analysis. Let's say a campaign. We're launching, let's say, a $5 million worth of marketing campaign. It's super high stake. What messaging do we put in? What kind of creative elements should we put in? All of that actually boils down to, for this particular context, what could we do is the highest level of scenario. What is the okay scenario. What are the scenarios we have on the sort of menu that we could do? And then once we figure out the risk versus reward of each option, it is much easier than to recalibrate all the options. And then when we make the recommendation to our powers uh, higher B, we can very well, very clearly articulate, hey, Mr. CMO, I recommend we do A, B, C, and D, and this is the option I recommend because here's the risk versus the reward. The risk and reward in this campaign scenario, for example, if we spend, let's say, $200,000, we get a higher Oscar-winning director who can do this video, and the messaging is blah, blah, blah. This is actually a, the figure is not real, but this process is real based on my experience working in large brands. But the other okay option would be we don't have to burn this much cost because there is potentially the message it doesn't work, et cetera. So really deeply understand all the risk factors and all the rewards and quantify as much as possible that whichever decision we make, we know how much the reward there might be and where are we aiming. And the risk is if because overtly when we ask risks, we know what risks we need, we need to mitigate and 
what is the worst case scenario and can we stomach the, the, the worst case scenario? Then that really gives you that peace of mind because no matter how crazy we go, we can tolerate the risk. And, and if we do it wide, uh, if there are times the reward is nobody knows, it's a swag. How do you do that? That when it's a scientific swag, this is where you need allies. You need to hold the hands of the execs and say, nobody knows, but in principle, are we good with that? Then if we are jumping off the cliff, we're jumping together. And so, so the risk versus reward boils down to, I think, quantify what you know. That makes the equation easier to calibrate across all the options. Then making sure when the data is unknown, you have allyship, you have buy-in from people, that then helps you to get out of the sort of holes of, wait, but it's all your fault. Well, it's not. Everybody agreed. So anyways, it's, a, it's an art um, more so, but in the meantime, it is a scientific approach that I think we can de-risk. Yeah. And, you know, one part of that that I like a lot is, is the element of sharing that risk reward analysis, maybe even in the presentation. So when you're presenting that, it's like, Hey, here's our recommendation. Here are the different options and the varying levels of risk and reward that we, uh, you know, have associated with them. Uh, and, and Hey, can you stomach these risks? Most marketers, I think when they're presenting a campaign, they sometimes gloss over the risks, you know, they are kind of crossing their fingers, hoping things work out for the best. They're presenting the rosy upside picture, which is what they, you know, uh, lock elbows and jump off the cliff, the executives with, but that could be a recipe for disaster. So true. So true. And in terms of risk, it's very interesting. There are actually roughly three buckets of risks. One is business risk. Maybe we won't get the outcome that we wish and we call, and they cost money. There's a second bucket, which is operational risk. Maybe doing so is going to be operationally so crazy that it's going to create downstream a lot more work for yeah. other folks. So the dependency third piece of risk, the marketers don't talk enough about, and I want to specifically call out is the political capital risk. Mm. Okay. I thought you were going to say reputational risk, like reputation to the brand, but political capital risk is very interesting. Right. The, the reputational risk is kind of, yes, it's, 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 it's probably in the third bucket. You're almost, you're not wrong because it's sort of the intangible, but it hurts reputation either to the brand or the person or mm. the team. Yeah. And this is where sometimes people choose to not make a move because they are afraid of tarnishing either the brand's reputation or their own reputation. And that's where hopefully they have deposited enough credit into the trust bank with their stakeholders. Mm -hmm. If they didn't, yes, in this case, if I were to advise them, I would say, if you don't have enough political capital, don't choose the most risky move. Yeah. Well, I, I can see where, where you get that. Uh, line of thinking, it might depend a little bit on who the audience is, because sometimes like when people are always playing it safe, uh, just from my own personal style, then they sometimes lose political capital by never taking any risks. So true. When there is a, there's a saying, if you are faced with a, uh, with a choice and you choose to take no action, that by itself, you have made a choice yeah. because you are keeping the status quo. Yeah. Yeah. There's another a very similar quote, which uh, I think is from Abraham Lincoln or somebody, but he goes, uh, when faced with a decision, the best answer is the best option. The second best answer is the worst option. The absolute worst answer is do nothing. Oh, that's so true. That's so true. Th this is true for life. This is true for, for work. Oh, you know, I want to expand on one point. I said, there's no regret necessary. You know why? It dawned on me. We, 
I've made plenty of mistakes before. Yeah. I was a pretty, uh, there, there are many times that I fail pretty miserably. But when I look back, there is absolutely no regret. The reason is I realized if we have personally tried our very best and we have gathered the information that was available to us at that point of time, even if it didn't pan out the way we have wanted, I feel personally very comfortable because I have done my very best given the information that was available to me. And do I change? Sure, next time, maybe I'll go different sources and get more information, but it doesn't make me any, I don't never feel necessary to go back and beat myself up on things that I don't think it's necessary. Same, I would say, for organizations, because I'm see, I've seen enough organizations where the risk aversion is causing a, is, is stifling innovation. Especially for revenue driving organizations, change change is a must because cheap money is gone. We have to change to improve our profitability. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I wish I could say that I had no regrets in life. I'm still kicking myself for not buying not buying that two thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin when it was like twenty bucks a coin. That we have some company, but um, well, we'll contain the amount of regret. Yeah. Maybe in a in a glass of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but no, I love that framework, uh, and I I find myself, and I think some others might be in this boat, but I find myself doing little miniature risk reward analyses, even on micro tasks. Mm. Like for instance, I'll be sometimes writing an email even to somebody. Yep. And it maybe it's an email where I'm, you know, expressing dissatisfaction or maybe offering some criticism to some people or um and it happens sometimes late at night when I'm on Slack, right? Because I try I try my darndest not to send late night Slack messages and I'm pretty good at it actually. Um but I'll sometimes be in the midst of writing like a long uh email and think what happens if I just don't send this, right? Like that's an option. I could not send this or I could send this tomorrow. Um, so I kind of do a small calculation with a lot of micro things in my head like that. I agree. I'm, I'm catching myself um, on some of these things too, where my situation as a small small difference to that is um, if I'm following up with uh, with some folks about, let's say, whatever, a project, I could either follow up with the whole group or I could specifically follow up with the person that I need that information from. In my usual self, because I am I just juggle many balls in the air, my normal operational mode is more communication, let's just hit it up, let's say add mention so-and-so in Slack, make it so easy to add mention because they will see it. But oftentimes I have to catch myself and say, is this really the the way that person is going to respond well, should I maybe privately message explaining the situation? And then I would give the same update, but it's it's through a different, like the finessing of working with people in general, I think really requires that risk versus reward uh, mentality, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Well, hey, I want to hear about Apps Flyer. Let's quickly summarize uh, what we talked about here. I'm going to take a stab at it, and then you fill in the blanks. So curiosity uh, is a very valuable uh, skill. It is a muscle that can be developed. Uh, it can be developed by simply thinking about the parts of the equation that you don't have uh, visibility into or you don't have access into, and then asking, okay, how does that work? And then even go on a mission to get as close as possible to it uh, to figure out how that works. And then once you, I, you know, once you do know that portion of the equation and you have some set of actions uh, that you could take, there's always multiple options. So you weigh out the various options. Think about like on a spreadsheet, you weigh out the various options, the potential outcomes of each of those options try to assign some quantitative uh, value for 
the reward, if that is the right option, the risk, if it's the wrong option, and then maybe some kind of uh, confidence multiplier, like how confident you are in it. I just made that part up. Uh, but then when presenting that to the executive team, present the best option and, you know, and with your recommendation, but also show them the risk reward calculations or some version of it so that they know what you thought through. And then at that point, when, when getting the yes, you lock arms with them and you jump off the cliff together. And in that way, there will be no regrets because, uh, you've used all the information that you have at your power and uh, there probably won't be that much in the way of negative ramifications because you've locked arms and aligned with the execs. So they now feel, you know, if it doesn't go well, at least they've been advised and involved in the situation. So it's just as much their fault as it is anybody else's. Yeah, very well summarized. I, uh, I think this is great. Nice. Cool. Well, I love that, that framework. And I'm going to start using it on more macro level things. I tend to just do those calculations in my head, but I'm actually with some of the bigger decisions, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely try that. And I, I think it will work out pretty well. So thank you for That's that. That's wonderful. That's great. Cool. Well, tell us about apps flyer. I'm pretty familiar with it, but, um, for folks that aren't, could you just give us kind of an overview of what you guys do and uh, what you're all about? Yeah. Um, so AppsFire is a mobile marketing measurement solutions company. We have been, um, we started as a, a primary attribution, mobile attribution solution provider, uh, and very quickly adopted by the gaming companies who perfect on the unit economics, especially uh, every dollar, when every dollar counted. But increasingly, a lot more businesses are adopting AppsFire solution because we really helps any company that with a mobile footprint to very clearly log the user journey, the digital footprint of their users from the acquisition to retention and monetization. And in this ecosystem, we also provide uh, very critically needed data signals, not only used by the advertisers, but also the media publishing platforms such as Meta, TikTok, Snap, so that everybody in the world, in the sort of post cookie world, uh, to really have a better solution set to understand all the critical data information that allows them to create this seamless and uh, ex superior customer experience. Yeah. And so the way that I think about it, and tell me if this is wrong, but we're not talking about the mobile experience in terms of like a mobile uh, responsive website. This is for companies that have apps, like mobile apps, like you use Uber Eats or you know Airbnb via the app, right? Yeah, primarily for the apps. Uh, we also have web to app measurement as well, but app is definitely uh, where people have found the most value. Uh, increasingly though, we are also expanding this capability to support the apps, if you will, on gaming consoles, on CTV, uh, so in a way, we are increasingly becoming platform agnostic, mm. uh, and it's a great supplement to the web metrics uh, that other companies may be familiar with. Yeah, and you guys are the big dog in the space, like because I, I know just from we have a few app install uh, clients, but when you go like in platform, it's like, hey, choose your you know choose your MMP or or you know mobile measurement partner solution. And like you guys are always number one on that list and it's not a very long list either. So good on you. Yeah, you're right on both fronts. We're the biggest, uh, our market share in this mobile measurement space is uh, close to 70%. What? Huge. We're Jeez. the biggest. That is massive. That's it's crazy. Oh my goodness. Well, how did you do that? I mean, what are the secrets to that kind of success or like, what are some of the points along the way that you, are most proud of the um, first to give um, credit to folks who have built the business before I joined. Um, I would I would I would say since I joined late uh, 2022, 22, uh, I have also 
very proudly contributed to some of that. But I'll just maybe highlight a few things where I believe AppsFire did, did right. The first is uh, we really listened to what the market needs are. So when we first started, the solution had always been customer centric. The second thing that really helped us is um, we deeply focused on being a independent, unbiased solution so that if you think of us as a, we're playing, let's say, a football game, we chose to be a, a referee that doesn't play. Despite some of our competitors, uh, you know, sold themselves to a media network, which then in this case, it's very much hard to say if they're independent. Yeah. That really helps our clients to feel comfortable the data we provide them. Mm -hmm. We have no skin in the game. Yeah. So we're just helping them. The third piece that really helped is we invested very deeply into the relationship and the experience with AppsFire, which elevates our brand to be a very trustworthy brand. Mm -hmm. Some of our events, um, in fact, uh, people call it call them magical. Really, very interesting. So I'm, uh, I'm hoping to uh, continue that legacy. Uh, most recently, we came out of uh, MAU, which is the biggest mobile marketing conference in Vegas uh, two weeks ago. Mm. Um, almost everybody said this has been AppsFire's best uh, experience at uh, at this trade show so far. Wow, awesome! So, um, what about? Uh... With you personally or your team, I know you've only been there a couple of years, which isn't very long, but are there any any big wins that you've posted or anything that you're really proud of uh, out of your own group? Yeah, for my own group so far, it's been amazing. Um, a little bit of background is as we grow out of a core sort of a original category, we are faced with a number of challenges ourselves too because it's sort of, um, you know, adolescence uh, growing pains. Mm -hmm. Um, So within my own team, it was very critical for my team to feel empowered that they can, they are in the driver's seat, that they do not need to take other people's playbook. So that was one, number one. And the second thing is uh, for my team to feel that they are well supported uh, and understanding how to navigate the intricacies of, having a POV while driving the larger org forward. Mm -hmm. And so in the past year uh, or so, my focus has been building my team dynamics, earning their trust while also giving them the space to unleash their own creativity and their own sense of ownership. And this has been really amazing to see. Uh, My folks on the team, Everyone is currently operating in a much more owner with a much more of an owner's mentality. Mm. And that was my single minded focus. So I'm really happy to see that's paying off. That's awesome. Well, that's an amazing achievement and an amazing win to really be getting, you know, the most out of your people. That's one of the areas that I've found to be like, well, I'm the founder here, right? So I've worn all the hats, I've done all the things. Uh, I recently asked myself, I read the book 80-20 Marketing again. I don't know if you've read it, but you would probably like it because it just is like, you know, focus on the 20% of things that drive 80% of the performance. And it caused me to think back and say, you know, of all the years that we've been doing this, what are the biggest, um, the biggest contributions that I've done? And there have been a lot, right? But the most powerful things that I've done by far are recruiting people, you know, because when you recruit the right person and that person thrives and grows in a role, then it's like, that's exponential, you know, that scale, like there's only so much that one individual can do. So I made it, it's, it's my new year's, it was my new year's resolution, basically talent magnet, you know, like that's the most powerful thing that I can possibly do is go out and find the best people that I can possibly find or that we can possibly afford and then bring them on, you know, bring them on the team and and put them in a seat or build a seat for them where they can really contribute at a high level. So that's awesome. Yeah, so true. Can't agree more. Cool. 
Well, um, I realize we're getting close to time here. I want to be respectful. I'm having so much fun, though. Um, can Same we talk? Here. Let's talk a little bit about the future. I'm curious. Are you testing anything new? Any new tools or tech? Like, what's what's um, what's the plan for the rest of 2024? Yeah, for uh, AppsFire in general, we believe in a couple things. One is with generative AI and the rise of AI in general, and knowing where our industry is, uh, that signal loss is not speculated anymore. It's basically coming. Increasingly, more companies are going to need a privacy-centric data collaboration solution. Mm -hmm. So we have invested very heavily into the data collaboration tools. Uh, we have unveiled this and we're actively enlisting the in early partners and advertisers into this ecosystem, mm -hmm. which, uh, by the way, recently we won an award for the work we're doing in the data clean room and the data collaboration side. Wow. So I'm very happy about that. Uh, one of them, actually, we also included uh, a large language model uh, capability within the data clean room so that you don't you do not need to wait until a data scientist would run a query for you you just talk and ask insights oh cool so that was amazing that's yeah. awesome the other yeah the other area we're excited about is to not only provide data but providing insights so our customers can take actions faster mm -hmm. this is on our um, upcoming roadmap in terms of surfacing the insights within mm -hmm. our platform Oh, that's awesome. That's right. very cool. Yeah. The third piece is uh, something my team is actively working on is to turn the power of AI into the hands of more marketers mm -hmm. through our creative analytics. Mm -hmm. So you probably uh, can empathize with this. When we run ads, oftentimes we have to grapple with what messaging, what creative elements, what works, what doesn't work. And this is in itself, you know, five different decisions in one piece of ad. And yeah. oftentimes everybody's running a hundred ads at once. Yeah. And like, yeah. And a hundred different campaigns across 10 platforms. Right. Yep. And while everybody is excited about Gen AI creating even more ads, it's a very natural pain point to think about, geez, which one really is working? So yeah. that is the tool we have launched. It's called Creative Analytics. And that automatically tells our advertisers which particular ad copy works well across all the media networks they have run ads on. Mm. But also, using AI, we tell them within the ad copy, is it a desk, the cat, the person? What is driving more response? So I'm super excited about that, and uh, we're 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 creating a lot of uh, very interesting uh, events and webinars uh, to further kind of educate the market and uh, and bring this to the hands of more folks. Yeah, no, that's really powerful. When when does the day come when you just like upload a whole bunch of different messaging and push go, and AI just like makes all the ads, connects with all the networks, and like does everything for you? I believe that this, this day will come. We're seeing some players in the in the market already claiming that they could do AI-based bidding. Mm -hmm. um, but it, if we look at the life cycle, usually you make an ad, you publish, and you look at the data, then you optimize. This doesn't currently reside in one vendor, but we're seeing some automations along this entire life cycle that I think someday this is going to come. Some of the customers within our set, they already are enabling what's called reverse ETL so that basically the data that from us, from other sources, they will pipe into the same data center, data lake. Then they will create sort of automated segmentation Reverse ETL basically helped them to hook up this insight into their campaign management surfaces. And then they would then use this insight, connect into all of the advertising placements, mm. and automatically show personalized experience. It's not um, everybody, but some of our very savvy clients are doing this. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. 
And I guess that intersects with the data collaboration and clean room because like That's right. network A doesn't want you to have access necessarily to all the data. So they clean it first, basically. And there's also in the industry uh, something that maybe more more marketers should know. While they run ads on Meta or on some of these other platforms, they will get a set of data points, but they don't get all. And us, um, advertise, sorry, um, AppsFryer, in the role that we play, we get additional signals from these media networks. Mm. But we are not allowed to share on a PII level. Right. So we're sitting on the wealth of data. They're sitting on the wealth of data. It is to their benefit to leverage solutions like ours so that they can append and enhance their first party understanding of, uh, of their audience. Mm, brilliant. I love that. Yeah. Um, and it, that's the same way where like within Facebook ads, say in platform, you can get certain metrics, but then when you use the API, there's other things available. Is that a similar kind of concept? It's really? similar concept. Yeah. The industry has changed so much that um, we have found that some of the Facebook preferred marketing partners, like this is years back, they were given some of these additional signals that is kind of changing where, you know, the different signals, how they share um, are not exactly the same. And this industry is every year, new things come out. Yeah. It's wild. Buckle up folks. It's here we go. It's wild. We're like, at, we're like at that inflection point right now. Yeah, which is also why um, we talk, you know, earlier in the segment about risk versus reward. That is where I get super excited because what we do at AppsFire is about curating, documenting, and enhancing the data available to marketers so that they make better decisions. And I think that's just align so well with my personal mission. Yeah, 100%. Well, Carolyn, this has been amazing. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your day to, to educate us with insights, to give us ideas, and to help us become more curious and, uh, and risk, risk avert uh, reward seekers, put it like that. That's right. Don't be afraid of taking risks. This is maybe a, a key message I want to convey is do not ever worry about risks to the point that you don't take actions because the best growth usually comes from the worst failures. That's that's a mic drop moment right there. I love it, Carolyn. Uh, well, thank you very much. This has been awesome. Um, let's do the lightning round and then we'll have you we'll have you on your way. Sounds great. Ready? Cool. Question number one is, if you were to start a side hustle, what side hustle would that be? Ah, that would be real estate flipping. I, I've done <laughs> this a few times over and uh, made some uh, good rewards. But most importantly, it's because uh, it gives me the platform to be creative. I can design the floor plan, the interior. Uh, it's sort of a Zen process for me. Yeah. And that is, uh, that's the epitome of risk reward decisions, right? Both micro and macro. So it's new. Cool. Yeah. Question number two is um, top three books or authors or influencers that have made an impact on you. Yeah, I'd say there are three books I really love. Uh, first one is uh, Power, Why Some People Have It and Others Don't mm -hmm. by Professor Jeffrey Pfeiffer. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing book for people to realize why sometimes we could not influence others. Okay. And I highly recommend a read. The second book is Principles by Ray Dalio. Mm -hmm. uh, one specific fact way I want to mention is Ray likes to mention in the book about seeking truth. Seeking truth in, in, its, in a silo concept doesn't quite make sense, but it makes a ton of sense when you put that together with the risk versus reward analysis. Mm -hmm. Why do you need truth? Because truth helps you to get closer to a more accurate risk versus reward analysis. Mm -hmm. Way to tie but, it back there. I like that. Cool. Right. The last one is Becoming by Michelle Obama. Oh. It's amazing transformation that she had documented in the book. It's amazing. 
Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely check those out and we'll include the links in the show notes. And then uh, question number three is how do you avoid burnout and how do you help your team also to avoid burnout? Burnout is real. Um, I think uh, the, the very first thing is uh, let's make sure we set proper expectations. Sometimes we burn ourselves out because we're trying to live up to promises that we have made, expectations we think others have on us. Make it clear, manage expectations. The second um, really is about, I think ultimately the outcome is to stay focused. When, when we are focused and the results out of those focus works segments is going to be of much higher quality. So we could do a lot more with less time. Mm-hmm. The third is uh, protect the time that you need to make yourself feel like alive. Uh, when I run long runs, for example, it's actually great because I feel like I'm living for myself, yeah. not everybody else. Or, or when I have my crochet class with my daughter, yeah, those are the precious moments that you know we're living. Love that. Love that. Good advice. Cool. Well, for everybody listening, uh, if you enjoyed this, if you learned anything, why not share this with a friend or drop a five-star rating for us wherever you get your pods. Uh, Carolyn, stay on the line for just one second. But for everybody else, that was another exciting episode of Revenue Driven CMO. And we will see you next time. And that's a wrap. Thanks for joining us here today. For show notes and other episodes, visit us at revenuedrivencmo.com. That's revenuedrivencmo.com. And hey, exclusive for listeners of this podcast, Web Mechanics will do 10 to 20 hours of work for you for free. Literally no sales calls, no BS. Just give them a problem and they will put a team to work for you for free for 10 to 20 hours. Even if you're already a client, if you're struggling with demand gen, lead gen, SEO, SEM, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, conversion optimization, if you can't get Facebook or meta ads to work for the life of you, or you can't figure out attribution, Web Mechanics will take a good hard look at whatever problem you give them, whatever programs you put in front of them, and they will give you an objective, informed opinion, plus some advice from 10 to 20 hours of senior level attention. And that's just because you're a listener of this podcast. So I would suggest take them up on this offer. It's ridiculous. Go to revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, fill out the two minute form and you will not regret it. Literally zero downside, unlimited potential for growth. So do yourself a favor, revenuedrivencmo.com slash free, no hyphens, no punctuations. You will be happy about that decision.